This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, episode 939, recorded on September 23rd, 2022. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses, Joining me today from Fort Lee, New Jersey, Dixon de Pommier. Hello, everybody. Hello, Tom, <laughs> in advance. <laughs> you see you again. <clears throat> it's a great day out there. It's a great day. It's, it's like one of the top 10 days of the year. It's clear. There's no humidity. There's a little bit of wind. It's in the 70s. If you live in San Diego, this is what it's like every day. But uh, in New York City, we have to take them when we get them. So we've got a great day. Out of it. Also joining us from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Uh, and here in Western Mass, it's a uh, an autumn preview kind of day. We've got yeah. broken mm. broken clouds, fifty nine Fahrenheit, fifteen C, and it's uh, blowing wow. twenty to thirty knots out of the northwest. Um, but it's oh. uh, it's actually it's a lovely day. It's spring. It's fall now, right? That's it. Yeah, it is officially right. fall. You know, I think you can tell because the the light is angular now, right? It's not not yeah. from above. You can tell that fall angle. Also joining us from Austin, Texas, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Uh, <laughs> partly cloudy. It's a nice day. Partly cloudy, but it's ninety seven <laughs> degrees. Okay, we're not out of this yet. And if I look at the uh, next two weeks. I don't see anything below 90, okay? Ouch. So, wow. uh, you know, it just keeps on, uh, it's it's unrelenting. But here we are. I, you know, it's better than 100. Um, you know. <laughs> so, Rich, Barely. I was, Rich, I, um, as I told you, I flew through uh, Houston last week on the way back. And it was one of those little planes where you get outside and walk to the terminal, right? Yeah. It was only 82 degrees, but whoa, was it humid? Yeah, humid. Houston humid. Houston is a lot more humid than this. I mean, you're right there on the water. Okay? Yeah, that's what yeah, I figured. It's humid. All right, we have for you a very, very special guest today. He is the Chief Scientific Officer of Crozet Biopharma, Tom Monath. Welcome to TWIV. Oh, nice to see you all. Nice to be here. Thank you. And Alan's giving you the weather report from where I live, too. So <laughs> He's in your you're, state, you're Alan. You're in Boston, right? Uh, about 50 miles west. So. Yeah. Okay. Wait, wait. Yeah. you're 50 miles uh, west of Boston? Yeah. Boston, so you, Mass. Oh, okay. Yeah. I've been through how there. F- how far west of Boston are you, Alan? I'm about pretty far. 70 miles mm-hmm. west of Boston. Um, oh, you're close yeah. to Tom. You could go have dinner. Yeah, yeah it's not that far. Good. And Tom, I, we talked earlier, but I have to say, again, I love the painting behind you. I just think it's so calming. No, so calming. That's I love wonderful. it. It's really nice. Did you, isn't it? did you actually paint that, Tom? <laughs> no, I didn't. But, uh, <laughs> this guy named Peter Batchelder, he's a quite a well known Cape Cod artist. And oh, that's what I would talk about. I mean, all his paintings are recognizably him. They all. Maybe not quite the same house or barn, but similar and, you know, local. Mm. Sounds nice. It, it almost looked and, like a replica of Thomas Hopper, or, or, or Edward Hopper, yeah, rather, sorry. Genre, yeah. Who was a Jersey boy, of course. <laughs> Is that right? What He was from New Jersey? I didn't know that. Where? Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see, where was he from in New Jersey? Yeah, I can okay. look it up. But, Don't worry uh, about it. All right. He ended up right. just over the border in New York someplace. <clears throat> uh, before we <laughs> chat with... Tom about science and his career. Uh, two announcements. First, remind everyone, Amy Rosenfeld, that the FDA is looking for a research assistant to help her on her experiments on enteroviruses. Uh, there's a description in the show notes. It's a PDF, and you can also find her email on that to uh, email her and find out more. And I also want to uh, tell you that a company called Vaccinated.us is uh, running a promotion so vaccinated.us thinks the spike protein of SARS-CoV-2 is the molecule of the year, <laughs> and they celebrate it by making spike t-shirts. They have a three-dimensional representation of spike on the front, and they they really like what we're doing here at TWIV. So for the month of September, they said all of their profits from these 
uh, shirts are going to go to Microbe TV to support our science programming. Oh, that's great. So Fantastic. go to, so go to vaccinated.us, uh, go to the spike shop and, and pick your shirts, put them in the car. The when you go to, shop. Isn't that great? <laughs> I love it. When, great. You, <laughs> when you go to check out, uh, use the promo code microbe TV and that'll tell them to direct the profits to us. And so buy your spike shirts and support microbe TV. And I want to thank Matt from vaccinated.us uh, for, for coming up with this. He approached me and said, we want to help you. And I think, uh, that's just great. That's great. I think Very somebody nice. should approach Spike Lee and get him to be the spokesperson for this, <laughs> also, because that would be the ultimate. He would do the right thing. <laughs> <laughs> he would do that. <laughs> uh, oh, this yeah. is a really cool representation of Spike. I'm looking at it this is. site. It's uh, it's Escher esque. Uh -huh. you know? Yes. Ah. Ah. Very interesting. So the company has an interesting story. They actually are a nonprofit. And they use their profits to support some other, some uh, some other kind of computer-based research or AI-based research, and um, they just like TWIV, so they want to help us out. So, this cool. Is cool, awesome, it's wonderful, wonderful. All right, Tom, uh, I want to start by and probably we'll start and end with your career because it's really long and fruitful. So, <laughs> take us from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> what, how you first got your education and got into science. Where did that start? Okay, sure. Well, um, I think, well, I got into science, interested in science in high school. It was a boarding school. And my science teacher, his name was Mayo Smith, and he had bio, sort of advanced biology classes. And we were doing experiments with uh, fruit, uh, fruit flies, genetics. And I was absolutely blown away. I mean, it was you know, absolutely fascinating. And I think that's when I made up my mind what I was going to do with my life. Um, went on to college uh, at Harvard and majored in biology. And I, my first, very first year, uh, took a graduate level course at herpetology. And I, I was sort of nat a natural <laughs> history biologist orient oriented in that direction. And, and I got really interested in that, and I spent hours and published my first paper actually on the opercular apparatus of salamanders. So this is about as far out <laughs> as you're going to get, right? And um, uh, 1965, and and so I decided I was going to be a herpetologist, and <laughs> the Museum of Comparative Zoology gave me some money, and I got a little more from National Geographic, and I started going on summer excursions to the tropics and collecting snakes and lizards and stuff, a, a, you know, a new species of frog from French Guiana. And, cool. And anyway, I was well on my way to that. My father said, what the hell are you doing? <laughs> 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 you know, you're never going to support a family. Huh? <laughs> so, um, so I said, okay, I'll do pre-med. <laughs> and so <laughs> and wound up in medical school. And uh, I continued those expeditions, though, until, you know, you didn't have summer vacations anymore <laughs> um, in medical school. And they were fantastic. I mean, all over the world and... and um, uh, still on herpetological expeditions for the MCV. So anyway, that was really how I I got it's sort of, you know, natural history oriented biology kind of morphed into medical uh, sciences, a medical career. And uh, but I was always interested in the tropics and at medical school fell under the spell of Tom Weller, who was uh, chairman of... Oh, yeah. Nobel laureate and virologist, of course. And um, they were doing a little arbovirus work at uh, at Harvard at the time. <clears throat> Tom Frothingham was working on Simbus virus. And um, so I, I decided, you know, tropical medicine was somewhat halfway between. Uh, I wasn't going to be a very rich surgeon, so I disappointed my father that way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, so that was that was really the basis of it, and that's how I got into tropical medicine. And then 
Vietnam came along. I, I'd finished my uh, internship in medicine at the Peter Brent Brigham and got drafted. And there was the, uh, the Berry plan, so I could stay another year. But then eventually I got a commission in the in public health service, <clears throat> avoided Saigon General Hospital and went to CDC. And uh, that's sort of where my, you know, the rest of my career started. So that, that's a short story of how I got there. So well, the, the army, the army got you back though, because you, we went from yeah. there to Yosemite, right? Right. You could change the color of your uniform. Um, you know, all the ranks were equivalent in different colors and so on. So in about hmm, 19, um, 88, Coop was the Surgeon General. Hmm. And um, he had a chief of staff uh, in, in the Department of Health and Human Services who was an ex army guy. And he said, You know, what do these guys do? We've got them, they're all commission officers. We can order them around. And so they're, you know, they don't shine their shoes and they don't wear uniforms. <laughs> so we so, uh, said, Every Wednesday, uh, the Public Health Service Commission Corps will wear their uniform. And um, I was up for Collins. I was the division director of the, the Division of Vector-Borne Viral Diseases at CDC. And I had a bunch of old military guys working for me, the, the entomologists and others, and they loved this idea. So <laughs> um, uh, we all you know, started wearing uniforms. And so I bought all these. Now, a public health service uniform in those days, I mean, they hadn't changed it since 1935. And you could, it was like one place. Since Theobald Smith designed them. (laughs) (laughs) So, Tom, you you were... According to your, uh, I'm cheating here, according to your CV, you were at uh, Peter Bent Brigham for internship and residencies for uh, eight years. Um, you must have been seeing, were you seeing patients during that time? Were you doing research, both? No, maybe the CV's wrong. I, uh, at, in between was my uh, military service years at CDC. And I came back. Okay. In the senior residency, um, but uh, no, I wasn't. I, total of uh, well, only three years. I see. In, in uh, the, the, where I'm going with the question mostly is that uh, you know I think of you as primarily a researcher, uh, mm-hmm. but you know your your degree is an MD. So the question is, um, uh, have you always thought of yourself as a researcher or? Uh, uh, have, have you seen have you seen patients much? Have you actually uh, practiced uh, in a uh, in clinical medicine very much? Well, no, I, I I see myself as a researcher, and I think most people in those days would say, oh, if you go to Harvard Medical School, you're not a real doctor. You're okay. <laughs> going to be a real. <laughs> <laughs> so um, no, I but you know you go through that. Um, uh, clinical training and of course it's about everything we do in one way or another is about uh, helping people and so I kind of missed that I did I did moonlight um, uh, a lot but I never kind of went back and really did clinical medicine full time and then you know you get so rusty that uh, don't trust yourself anymore so <laughs> and there's uh, there's two fellowships in here that uh, I'd be interested in hearing about one is uh, at the University of Ibadan in Nigeria, and the other uh, that strikes me as sort of sticking out is uh, in the Department of Gastroenterology and MGH that seems to come in the middle of your stint at Fort Collins. So what about the Nigerian <laughs> fellowship? Yeah. Well, that was, uh, I was lucky enough um, to... Uh, when I was at CDC in Atlanta and, and all my colleagues, you know, in, in the arbovirology unit, there's such a 
it's such a discipline that is involved with um, natural history and uh, vertebrates, invertebrate vectors, and the you know the complicated transmission cycles. And they'd all been working in the tropics, and I still had that bug. So in 1970, 69, 70, there was a, a big yellow fever epidemic in Nigeria. And um, through just networking and so on, um, I got CDC to send me over there for two, a two-year assignment. Uh, and it was to uh, uh, Ibadan, in in uh, western Nigeria and where the the last of the Rockefeller virus laboratories was located and uh, we'll go back to that that's a really interesting story and, and had such an impact on my life the, the Rockefeller Foundation program but um, so I spent two years there it, the lab was located on the university and I did some teaching and stuff there so that that's how I it was sort of a fellowship um, but that that's the story there and uh, uh, then I, I I guess I did a good job for CDC and so they offered me a permanent position very rare you know the commission core is so small and so places like NIH and CDC as you know to get a permanent position was um, we were very competitive so that's um, uh, that that's what the Nigeria thing was uh, MG Asian gastro so I was at a meeting in well let me back open so David Sensor was the uh, director of CDC in um, late 80s and, and 90s uh, fantastic guy and one of the last sort of eight non-political appointments at the Centers for Disease Control, and we really come up through the ranks. And um, so he said, you know, um, somebody, there's always got to be somebody in the public health service who's an expert on yellow fever because, it, you know, it's still one of the last quarantinable diseases we could have it in the U.S. And, and so he said, you're it. And... <laughs> that was sort of the, the lifelong <laughs> interest. Um, yeah, no, so I was in a meeting on yellow fever in Brazil. Must have been hmm, 80, 80, <clears throat> 85, maybe. And uh, I met a guy named Jack Wands, who was at MGH. He was in the GI group and, he, and uh, was working on uh, viral, you know, liver disease, didn't know anything about yellow fever, got interested in it, and he had a great, interesting program, sort of molecular pathogenesis of hepatitis B and, and C, and um, so he invited me to spend a year there, um, and I, you know, it was time to have a sabbatical after about a, um, oh, 15, 12 years at CDC, so they sent me off there for a year, and um, we worked, worked together. I actually worked. Yeah, so that, that's how. Yeah, I, I guess uh, I th I think of uh, gastroenterology usually as uh, intestines, but it's uh, it's yeah. liver too, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that that makes more sense. So yeah. your your permanent position with uh, CDC is this? Uh, most yeah. of that is uh, that's Fort Collins. Right. Um, you must yeah, know Fred Murphy. Oh, my God. Well, <laughs> Fred will tell you that I was supposed to work for him when I got drafted <laughs> and went to CDC. And um, I love the guy. And we, we worked closely together for years. But I, I decided after visiting there that I really wanted to do the arbovirology unit where, you know, I'd have a chance to stomp around in the jungle and look for <laughs> for viruses so that's uh, maybe maybe catch a few snakes and lizards while you're there yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah. so I'm you, sure you knew Dwayne Gubler while you were there also oh yeah so well, Dwayne was uh, Fort Collins had a a section in San Juan mm -hmm. working on dengue specifically right 
And uh, Dwayne, um, so Dwayne worked, actually worked for me, and then he took over for Collins when I, uh, when I left. Indeed. I just visited Fort Collins this summer, and my host, uh, no. Shouts, Bob Shouts? No, that's not his first name, is it? Tony. Tony Shouts. He, uh, he drove, so they have a part of their campus that's right across from the CDC. Uh, he showed it to me up by right. the foothills there. Um, right. Uh, well, you weren't there, though. You had left, according to your CV, you had left by the time the NEPA samples came there initially, right, in, hmm. in the 90s. Yeah, no, right. I left in 1989, and uh, uh, I had to give up all those old public health service uniforms I was, you know, collecting. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I had, always Halloween. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's true. You know, do you know where the ribbons are made for uh, public health service uniforms? No. You know, but, so I, I don't know about today, but at the time. Uh, the last leper colony in Louisiana. Oh, yeah. Uh, there was a cottage industry there. And they oh, would yeah. make their ribbons for public Carville, health service. That was Carville, Interesting. right? Carville, yeah. Huh. So, Which in public health service uh, hospital. So, so, and, uh, but I had all these funny colored ribbons, you know, on my army uniform. And it, nobody could understand what the hell they were. <laughs> 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 so you spent these years in Fort Collins doing research and doing some... Uh, directing and so forth, doing some field work as well? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, we started field programs in Ecuador to work on Venezuelan encephalitis mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah, but a bunch of others, uh, mainly in tropical America. As, mm -hmm. as I understand it, you're credited with um, identifying the natural host for loss of fever, correct? Loss of fever virus. Right. So how, does, uh, mm -hmm. how did that happen? How does that fit into this story? Mm -hmm. Right. Well, um, when I was in Nigeria in, that, in, in um, uh, the uh, it was like 1969, 70, 71, um, <clears throat> and I was about to leave, and my wife and daughter and I were going to go to Italy for a little R&R, &R, and I got a call from Sensor, and he said... Uh, do not pass go. You know you're not leaving Africa yet. Go to go to uh, Liberia, where we think there's an outbreak of loss of fever. Ah. So that was 1971. Uh, was this the initial yeah, outbreak? 72. No. In Zor you know, it was a little outbreak at a hospital, uh, missionary hospital in, in Zorzor, and um, it was kind of the same playbook as the original outbreak there. Uh, a lot of nosocomial infections and nurses, uh, the one had died. And, and <clears throat> so I, I worked that up and um, so sort of introduced to Lhasa. And then I, I got back to the States and within months, there was another larger outbreak, not far away in Sierra Leone in 72. And uh, so I organized a group and we went that and the whole, the, the, one of the goals, other than just, uh, you know, investigating the outbreaks, doing CDC stuff, was to try to find the natural reservoir because Absolutely. it was unknown. Absolutely. And uh, so I brought with me, you know, Fort Collins was, uh, uh, you know, we worked on the ecology, really, of arboviruses. So I brought our, our mammologists and... Um, uh, veterinary uh, folks, and we uh, you know, spent a lot of time catching critters um, during that outbreak, which was in Pangama. It was a, uh, a dangerous kind of area because it was a diamond mining area, and there was a lot of illicit uh, diamond mining and a lot of crime and stuff. And there. Anyway, so you're out, you're out in the bush, and... <laughs> I was wary of that and uh, collecting all these. So brought back, so all the specimens, um, you know, we couldn't identify all of mammals on the spot. So we had to pickle everything. And we sent back, uh, I mean, this was the days of 
we call it, it's the Wild West, really. I mean, you know, <clears throat> just how we managed personal protective equipment and, I mean, it was very primitive. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, sent all the, the pickled rats and stuff back to the Smithsonian. And a guy named Setzer was the curator, and he identified them all, and we took the uh, appropriate specimen of liquid nitrogen back to CDC and um, in Atlanta um, and worked them up in the hot lab there. And I think we made 12 or so isolates, and they were all from the same species of uh, uh, multi mammoth rat mastomies natalensis. And so that was the, uh, yeah, that was the uh, discovery of the reservoir. I mean, it was kind of predictable because uh, loss is a uh, you know, close relative of, of lymphocytic chorea meningitis, obviously, rodent virus. And, uh, but also bats were suspected, so we collected a lot of bats. But um, so that was uh, that's, uh, and I, I sent it into Science as a paper, and um, they rejected it. <laughs> so I said, Not relevant. So, <laughs> <laughs> Try so, a specialty uh, journal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, a little bit. Of, we prevailed on them to publish it eventually. <laughs> so, Tom, this this is one of my favorite books. I keep it right behind me, Fever, which <laughs> now, you figure prominently in this book. I just looked your first, l listen to this, page 237. In, in Ibadan, Tom Monath, a CDC virologist on loan for the university, was in the process of packing his household goods to return with his family to the U.S. when a cable arrived from the U.S. State Department. It's just what you told us. Yeah. <laughs> Isn't that great? Yeah, that's, oh, where, is... uh, that's, that's how I knew that yeah. Tom was involved in that, and, and oh. things started falling together for me. But I, I, so I really you, wanted to hear the story. You must have known John Frame pretty well then. John Frame, oh, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, I've been in car now, now I'm getting so old, and my memories are... Fading these things. You try to remember the story you've told multiple times, but not all at rest, you know. So I I decided I would try to write a, a book, which I uh, so, so I'm I'm actually I started this a while ago and and now I know how painful it is to write it. You know, I've written a lot of scientific stuff, but um, so you put it down. So I, I managed to Scraped together four or five pages so far, but it's about <laughs> it's about the loss of the loss of experience that we just talked about. Not yeah. Yeah. I'm framed. Well, I mean, what an amazing, amazing story. Absolutely. Uh, and he was, uh, you know, the around that time, of course, the isolation of the virus was made at Yale mm -hmm. um, by Jordi Casals right. and. Um, <laughs> Indeed. His colleagues and, and Jordy got a lab infection. I, and it was not particularly surprising to me because Jordy was always telling me how to how he made uh, sucrose acetone mouse brain antigens. Uh, you know, he was a taxonomist, of course, and viral taxonomist, and so he made a lot of reagents. And so I said, you know, I said, yeah, I just use a regular kitchen wearing blender and. <laughs> put put the mouse brains oh, in man. there, and, and uh, I usually put a kind of a a cloth over it, you know, to, in case there's aerosols. And so. But anyway, he he managed to get infected with loss of virus, and uh, uh, was hospitalized, it, and probably rescued by getting convalescent plasma from one of the nurses who recovered. Nurse Pinio. Video, yeah. She was at our hospital. Yeah. <laughs> was she? Yeah. Oh, yeah, Columbia. Yeah. Oh, Columbia, yeah. Were you there at the time, so, Dixon? Lord, that's a great um, advertisement for barrier medicine because they didn't have a clue as to what she had. And, you know, until the diagnosis came back, she could have spread that to almost everybody that walked in the room unless they followed suit and put on the right gear and discarded the right gear. And, and it all worked out. It was quite lucky, I think, that uh, that happened. 
Dixon, were you there at the time? I was. Yeah, John you- Frame loves telling that story, by the way. Well, I've got to tell you another Columbia story. You probably remember this, Dixon, too. The, the, the next loss outbreak in Sierra Leone, I went with two by young EIS officers from CDC to work up. And, and one of them, um, Kent Campbell, you, I'm sure you know, became president of the American Society of Tropical Medicine and right. Right. And uh, so Kent was one of these, the young guys. And this was at a missionary hospital, another missionary hospital, Catholic missionary hospital in, in Sierra Leone. And so at the end of the, of the investigation, he went back to England to try to track down nurses who'd served in that hospital back into the World War II era to try to get blood samples and see, if, you know, was this really an old disease? Because we didn't know, you know, how, how long right. been around. Right. Right. <clears throat> anyway, he got to London, he met with his wife, and they were doing, you know, some tourism as well as tracking down uh, nurses. And he fell ill just within a week. <laughs> And um, he uh, was admitted to the Hospital for Tropical Diseases in London oh, yes. and uh, put into isolation. Now, you know, uh, they may be good at diagnosing guinea worm or something, but, <laughs> uh, you know, this is a, a potentially fatal viral hemorrhagic fever. And uh, so Kent is lying there. He calls his father, who's a physician in Kentucky, I think, and says, um, Dad, you got to get me out of here. This cross between a chronic care facility and a, and a nursing home, you know, and I'm, I'm dying of loss of fever. And so I was, it was a sensitive issue, but Sensor, again, sent me over as the ambassador to extract Kent. And uh, sent us this uh, plane, which was owned by, maybe by NASA, that had the capsule where they quarantined the astronauts, came back from the moon. Oh, you know? yes. Oh, and yes. Know. And so I went over and met with Tony Woodruff, quite a famous parasitologist. And so we were going in, and Kent was in isolation, sort of in an open ward, you know, segregated. And Woodruff said, we better mask up and stuff. So I said, sure. So we masked, you know. And he wore his mask right under his nose. <laughs> and we, we went in to visit Kent. And I you know, I examined him. And I was sure it was not Lhasa. But yeah, we right. medevaced him right. uh, out to Columbia. And uh, I took specimens down to Atlanta. And I'm sure it was something else. But... Um, yeah, that was, uh, and so I was flying on this capsule and, you know, making sure Count was all right. His wife was on there and and I went to the bathroom. I, so I said, where's the, when you flush this quarantine, where's it go? And, uh, you know, I asked some of the staff, was, oh, it just goes out like any airplane. Great. <laughs> <laughs> <Right. laughs> Yeah, they've learned so, a lot since cholera, haven't they? <laughs> <laughs> Arg. Arg. So uh, in early 90s, uh, you make what looks to me like a real significant shift in career trajectory from government service, CDC, to the commercial sector, a canvas. So, right. how did that come about? Well, well, I've been uh, I've been in uniform for I think twenty six years, and I, you know, eligible for retirement. Um, USAMRID was undergoing some pretty significant changes, financial problems, and so on, and it became a, that's where I was working as, as chief of virology division, and uh, I went there because I. I got interested in making vaccines. I thought this work on the epidemiology of disease is wonderful and a great time, but it feels like I, you know, I want to make something specifically and, and specific and tangible that will help people. And 
and vaccines, and, you know, interested in vaccines. Actually, when I was in Fort Collins, we had big outbreaks of St. Louis encephalitis mm-hmm. over several years in the 70s. And, and I started kind of a effort at CDC on developing a vaccine that should be very feasible. Japanese encephalitis, very similar virus and successful, simple, inactivated vaccine was approved. And um, so we started that. But I, I soon learned, you know, the CDC was not the place to develop a product. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, I thought the Army might be better. They were doing a lot of vaccine research. And so I learned a lot. And But it was time to go somewhere where I could really do that. And... Um, so that's it. It wasn't actually a canvas. It was this company, private company called Oravax, and their uh, the interest there was on mucosal immunity, which was pretty hot in those days. And we all thought this could be harnessed to uh, you know develop some interesting products uh, based on eliciting mucosal immunity <clears throat> or giving it passively. And the technology, that company, core technology was IgA monoclonal antibodies. And they had a program on RSV. Uh, I'll tell you a little more about that if we have time. But um, so I got recruited there and uh, that was my first job in industry. I I think we had 20 people in the company at the time. And it went public within two years. Everything was going public (laughs) in those days very quickly in biotech and uh, a lot of failures, of course, as a result. But uh, so that was, and and that uh, it then merged with a small company in England called Peptide Therapeutics and, and that became a canvas. Okay. Yeah. And and there you uh, worked on quite a fit, quite a number of uh, vaccines and, and I wonder if you could talk a little bit about uh, using yellow fever as a backbone, right? Chimeravax. Right. How did that come about? Yeah. Yeah, we had lo- a lot of different vaccines, but, well, um, I mean, I was always interested in yellow fever, and I, I thought yellow fever 17D was an amazing vaccine. I mean, I really studied its origin and history. And, you know, of course, empirically developed by passage and unusual host the uh, kind of the mm. original idea with vaccine development and uh, <clears throat> uh, Max Tyler who got the Nobel Prize, only Nobel Prize for vaccine I think at least at that time um, had developed this and he tried to reproduce his experiments which involved serial passage of wild type yellow fever and uh, never could do mm. that. And I mean, we now know that, you know, from sequencing it, it's a very complex, multigenic series of mutations result in attenuation. <clears throat> and um, no wonder he couldn't reproduce it. But, uh, you know, the infectious clone technology had just appeared. Charlie Rice had reported the first uh, sequence of uh, yellow fever 17D um, and uh, I was communicating with him and on various projects and um, one of his fellows, Tom Chambers um, uh, was working on a yellow fever infectious clone and introducing um, other genes, flavivirus genes and so we um, hatched this idea that, you know, let's, this is a nice academic project, but let's uh, turn it into a product. So um, Tom Chambers and I met in Washington, D.C., and along with Dennis Trent, who was at FDA. And Dennis, I've recruited to Fort Collins years before as our head of molecular Virology, and we sat down, and I remember this very specific event in a restaurant in Washington and sketched out kind of the, the plan on a napkin <laughs> for cloning. Uh, Where all good ideas start. Uh, yes. Yeah. 
<laughs> so that's how it started. And we started a project and licensed in the technology from uh, St. Louis University hmm. and uh, at a canvas. And I built a team, you know, to, to work on this. And we started with uh, Japanese encephalitis, uh, which was a in act, you know, existing vaccines were made in mouse brain tissue, not wearing blenders, but close to it. <laughs> and, <laughs> um, lousy, you know, multi dose. Uh, there were some adverse events, so so that was the first um, recombinant yellow fever seventeen D with the uh, envelope protein of of JE, and brought that into the clinical trials within several years. And then dengue, we're, we're working on dengue, which much more complicated. And um, but Lance Gordon, who was the CEO at the time, and I went down to visit um, Santa Fe Pasteur in Pennsylvania. And I presented a slideshow to the CSO, uh, block in his name now. Uh, anyway, so we, I said it was about dengue vaccines um, made in this way. <clears throat> it was like five o'clock in the afternoon in Poconos. Nowhere, you know, we were only one flight left. And at the end of the day, he said, You're not guys are not leaving till we sign a term sheet. <laughs> we want us. <laughs> so that, that almost never happens in big pharma, right? But uh, so we, and then they began, you know, a collaborative program with Santa Fe to develop the dengue uh, vaccine, which, uh, yeah, there, and, and Rich pointed out there have been a number of challenges. That is a licensed vaccine now, mm-hmm. um, Dengvaxia. Um, but we'll be undoubtedly superseded by better mm-hmm. uh, vaccines. Do, do you want to talk a little bit about the Dengvaxia Experience. I mean, we've talked about it on TWIV and the events surrounding yeah. it, but you were directly involved in the development. I mean, how did that how did that play out for you? Well, I, I mean, I, the JE vaccine was so successful. I mean, it was an unbelievable success in terms of performance, safety, and everything that's widely used now. And we thought protection against dengue was all about neutralizing antibodies and, you know, simple assays. Mm. And we were able to generate strong neutralization titers in monkeys with all four serotype, you know, yellow fever, dengue recombinants, vectors. <clears throat> and we mixed them together. We could get responses to all four in very specific uh, monoclonal-based neutralization tests. And uh, we th- it all worked perfectly. And it didn't, it didn't translate so well in humans at first. We tested the dengue 2 alone as a monovalent, and that worked great in humans, like the JE vaccine, safe, uh, low viremias, and... Um, high neutralizing antibody titers. Uh, we started mixing mixing well four together. Things got more complicated. Uh, anyway, Santa Fe, uh, uh, you know, set upon a, a large international program on clinical development. Uh, we were um, still doing manufacturing at a canvas and transferring that to them. And uh, they built a factory. <laughs> I mean, we're talking about you make hundreds of millions of dollars commitment to a program so that you're ready if you're successful mm. at the time of commercialization. You know, there's big risks involved, big money risks involved. And anyway, um, well, you probably have reviewed the whole story, but um, a trial in we're always worried about safety because of the immunopathogenesis of, you know, the, the problem you can sensitize and not immunize and have a safety problem with secondary infection. So that actually 
happened in trial in, in Thailand. <clears throat> and uh, so uh, we had a meeting in, at Santa Fe when Scott Holstead and I and others were brought in and, and uh, they revealed this. And this was late in the stage of development. It was very disappointing. And, um, and they persevered and they got it through the FDA. Um, but, you know, in retrospect, what was wrong about our <laughs> scientific dogma is that it almost always comes back and throws you a curveball because neutralization then, you know, it turns out to be extremely complicated. There are strong neutralizing epitopes and poor ones and the assays don't really reveal what um, is going on. And so we were... Yeah, I mean, it, it, it was, it, the mistake was that um, it's not all about the envelope protein and neutralization, and all the, all the other genes were from a heterologous foreign virus, yellow yeah. fever, um, and, um, you know, I think you need, for example, you need antibodies against NS1, which was yellow fever, not dengue in our vaccine to be fully protective and you need good T cell responses, specific killer cells, which are mainly from NS5, which again is yellow fever, not dengue in the Comerovac. So um, for a complicated virus like dengue, unlike the encephalitis viruses, uh, where a little neutral neutralization keeps the virus out of the brain, dengue is different. Yeah, so that, that, animal, that and so are you thinking that uh, is an appropriate conclusion that the actual correlates of protection for Japanese encephalitis different than dengue? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think NS1, NS1 is the difference. Is the main, NS1 is a very unique viral toxic protein that actually is responsible for vascular leak. And we showed... Uh, that you could actually use that virus and that antigen alone in a very effective protective immunogen. So I think you need that. That's absent from chimera. Kind of this is really very yeah. interesting because, you know, we've talked about this before, in particular with respect to SARS-CoV-2. And, and, and I think we got lucky in a way with SARS-CoV-2 that Spike does the trick. Okay? It didn't have to be that way. So, Tom, uh, you mentioned it would that dengue vaccine would probably be replaced. There are a couple of candidates now where the, it's dengue virus and not yellow fever backbone, right? And that's the that's the trick, right? Yes, I think that's really important. And uh, the Takeda vaccine looks really good. I mean, all of these vaccines have the problem that they're mixtures of four different viruses. Yeah. The live, the live vaccine. <clears throat> and uh, so you get all sorts of complex interactions and interference. Mm -hmm. So, on. I mean, they're probably not replicating exactly the same rate. So you've got innate responses that are, you know, hampering the slower growers. It's a simple-minded kind of concept. But <laughs> I, I, yeah, so the Takeda vaccine doesn't Worked there while with dengue four, but that's not such an important mm. virus. So I think, yeah, it'll be good to have more than one and vaccine out there. And of course, dengue vaccine limited to use in people who've had a prior experience with dengue. Right. So, so in your CV, you mentioned uh, using this backbone for West Nile vaccine. Is is, is that still ongoing? Uh, well, that worked absolutely as well as JE, which is not so surprising. Uh -huh. And I, uh, we brought it through phase two trials in, in, I mean, in 1999 when West Nile came in. This was a, I mean, an amazing story, right? This fire swept across the country in three years. Mm -hmm. And 
decimated the horse industry in many places and uh, and and knocked off some old people. I mean, it, you know, this it. Uh, I thought there was a public health problem that would never go away. It hasn't gone away, but it hasn't reappeared in major epidemic form. It has basically displaced St. Louis encephalitis, hmm. um, competed it out because it's more efficiently transmitted. And anyway, and uses the same hosts and vectors. Uh, but <clears throat> so <laughs> I was still in a canvas and we we're ready for phase three. Now, the problem with how do you really do that? Um, the animal rule didn't apply because even though we had good models, because FDA said, well, it's prevalent enough, you go out and show it works. Mm -hmm. you know? So um, I went down to uh, Tony and got a meeting with him and said, look, this is a a public health problem is not going to go away in the U.S. I, I think we can do a study. I've had a plan for a phase three trial in the Dakotas where we have very pretty high attack rates consistently. And um, it's going to cost 50 million bucks or something like that. You know, peanuts. And NIH has paid for, you know, phase three trials of disease of public health importance like the general herpes vaccine and so on, studies they supported. Um, and uh, anyway, he thought about it. He said, you know, he'd think about it, but we never got it funded. And the company was not, I mean, the market side, the market opportunity had decreased every year. And so it, and Santa Fe bought the company in 2006. They continued the West Nile program for a while. I left. Uh, but they dropped it mm. eventually. So it's sitting there. It could be dusted off. Huh. And made it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the other program that was successful is the new uh, smallpox vaccine, right? Which is in the news again, ACAM 2000. You remember that? <laughs> oh, of course. Yeah. Because <laughs> we talk about it a lot, um, right, Rich? <laughs> yeah. So ACAM 2000 was developed at a campus under your watch, right? No. Yes. I mean, it was uh, pretty, well, <clears throat> I, w I, I was very involved in bioterrorism issues when I was in the Army and continued. Um, uh, Josh Letterberg had recruited me to uh, kind of surreptitiously work for the Central Intelligence Agency on uh, bioweapon threats and so on. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, I was working closely with D.A. Henderson and others. And after 9-11, um, D.A., I think, really raised the alarm. You know, D.A. Henderson, of course, eradicated small power, gets credit for doing all the eradication work. And by the way, the smallpox program was way underway in Nigeria when I was living there. And I, I drove a smallpox truck around. Oh, yeah, cool. And... Uh, so I knew all those folks. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so D I'm not quite sure where this is all. Maybe I've got the the dots connected the wrong way, but um, there was this uh, dramatization of a smallpox epidemic called Dark Winter, which was presented to Congress, um, very close session. Um, it, it's now available. You can, you can probably find it. But it was a, you know, it was a dra dramatization, like a movie of the unfolding of an introduction of smallpox at one location in the U.S. and how rapidly it would be spread through, you know, com just transportation and, as far you know, I mean, this is monkeypox on steroids, right? Um, and so, Congress. So everybody got very excited about this. Um, I don't know that the Soviet, I mean, I know, you know, they were working on smallpox, but I was aware of that program. I, I really don't link their efforts so much other than the fact that smallpox virus still exists in the freezer. 
Um, but uh, a crash program to develop a, a, a vaccine, you know, started. Um, <laughs> one of the most amazing things, I, I was in Washington for a meeting and somebody from senior person in the FDA came up to me and he said, anything you want, anything we can do, you just tell us how we can help you get this vaccine <laughs> developed. I mean, that, you know, pretty extraordinary. So we kept it simple. We, sim we got a hold of the existing dry back calf lymph vaccine and um, it behaved very well in cell cultures. Uh, we started out with M1C5, which is an approved continuous cell line, uh, diploid cell line, and simply plaque purified Grivax and characterized the clones with respect to, you know, growth in cell culture and virulence, mainly using sucking mouse neurovirulence as the assay and selected a clone that looked a little less virulent than Drivax, the original vaccinia, smallpox Kaplan vaccine, and um, started human trials. And then MRC5 didn't work very well, so we switched to Vero cells and made a second generation one called what? The first one was ACAM 1000, and then we made ACAM 2000, and uh, Sequencing was, at the time, you know, this was a big virus, big viral genome. So this was all done by good old style virology, not um, with the tools of molecular virology selecting things. And <clears throat> nevertheless, uh, you know, did a series of many clinical trials, showed it to be immunogenic. Uh, made a POC, which is the sign of a take, and um, was a little less immunogenic, in my recollection, than Drivax in terms of neutralizing antibodies. But um, um, seemed to be less, less neurovirulent, which was the principal thing we worried about. Um, yeah, and so that was, and then again, you know. Surprises occur because <laughs> we got to phase three, and which involved several thousand subjects, and again, non inferiority study with Drivax um, based on the POC we take. And uh, lo and behold, um, around that time, there was a lot of immunization of military and with with Drivax, and, and they noted um, myocarditis occurring. Hmm. And um, then we started to see it with ACAM 2000, and it was not uncommon. I mean, this was like one in, less than one in 200 people uh, develop um, chest pain and, you know, EKG changes and so on. So I... I convened a board of cardiologists to help us. <laughs> and uh, the main thing I learned, they were at dinner with them the first night. And I, they were all talking about taking statins. These are all cardiologists. You know. mm -hmm. And uh, so I said, hmm, boy, they know something I don't know. So that's when I, uh, you know, the, I learned, learned something about cardiology, nothing to do with smallpox. But they were... Um, were helpful. I mean, we had to do a lot of EKGs, and, and uh, the you know, we don't really know. There's no, there were no deaths, so we didn't have any autopsy material. I presume temp just from temporal relationships is probably actual direct viral injury, um, infection, direct viral injury, <clears throat> but we don't really, don't really know and this. Then we discovered some really funny things with all of, everything been reported before, but not emphasized. And that a number of people developed a biological false positive test for syphilis hmm. as a result of 
small parts of music. And this was an auto, obviously an autoimmune phenomenon. So, I mean, absolutely fascinating uh, uh, virus. We, we were all focused on the practical aspects of, you know, getting a vaccine out there. So was AKM2000, uh, with respect to myocarditis, was AKM2000 really any different than Drivax? Well, uh, I think we, we had cases about the same incidents. As I recall, let's go back and look at the numbers. That's one of the things I'm thinking is that yeah. you know yeah. this must have been going on for decades, all through right. the smallpox eradication mm-hmm. campaign, but centuries, in, in, yeah, centuries. <laughs> but in that <coughs> in that circumstance, you know, you're comparing uh, uh, non-lethal cases of myocarditis with smallpox, okay? And so uh, it's it's not as mm-hmm. noticeable as if you're vaccinating an entirely healthy population with uh, not the, uh, the sort of imminent risk of smallpox out there. Well, the incident was, uh, yeah, I, I think also, you know, a lot of smallpox immunization was uh, in very young children who didn't complain. Mm. Uh, and so I, I think that's also a factor. But, <clears throat> but yeah, now, yeah, uh, and then, you know, other than the clinical development, the manufacturing was a huge challenge. We had a factory and a canvas outside of Boston and made um, nearly 200 million doses of this vaccine delivered under contract to the government. And I mean, transformed this company, in, you know, hmm. from, uh, uh, you know, always searching for the next dollar <laughs> to do. Uh, uh, to, you know, having made a significant profit over a few years, that was extremely helpful, obviously. You must have worked with yeah. Michael Mer- Merchlinski on this, right? Yeah. Yeah, well, well Barda didn't exist uh, at the time. I see. Um, but I knew Mike. Uh, he was at FDA. Yeah, Zebras. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <clears throat> of course, we worked with Bernie Moss and with, yeah, we're in touch uh, still today on uh, uh, a lot because he's at Barda. We're working with them on a Marburg vaccine. But, hmm. Yeah. So uh, at some point you left the canvas, right? <laughs> and then you went to a series yeah. of, of other companies. Um, so what, what were you thinking about at that point? Well, um, <laughs> I got, uh, what happened was a canvas was acquired by Santa Fe Pasteur mm. and I didn't really want to work for Big Pharma. So I I got an offer to, at the time, um, a famous venture capital firm, Kleiner Perkins, um, was setting up a pandemic fund. They were foresighted. Uh, no other venture capital group was doing this kind of stuff, but they uh, we're concerned at the time the H5N1 avian influenza epidemic was uh, unfolding, and and um, so they cre- they raised quite a lot of money from the usual uh, sources uh, to form a new fund, move two hundred million dollars to work on. Um, Pandemic preparedness, basically. Um, this, you know, before the government was doing it. And they recruited me as a vaccines guy. Um, and of course, you know, I was an operational <laughs> person. And, 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 but anyway, I, I was getting on, you know, been, I've been in a canvas for 15 years or something. And uh, so this was a new, Opportunity and and um, so I did that and the the firm Kleiner Perkins um, went about in addition of funding you know interesting products they with the money they went about setting up Barda I mean that was literally hmm. the idea interesting and so we they had Republican and Democratic lobbyists. Um, and, you know, brought together meetings with 
a lot of people with familiar names and so on about how to do this. And I, I went to the Hill a lot, you know, talked to um, senators and uh, Ted Kennedy and others and Chris Dodd and, you know, got kind of congressional movement behind this. And Barter was stood up as a result. <laughs> And, um, and so that was I think, the, uh, 2006. Uh, so it was, uh, you know, foresighted thing. Now, that was all great, but um, finding investments that were, well, first I was thrust into this unfamiliar world of venture capitalists. And uh, now instead of looking for money, I had the money. But I had to find the you know the right projects, and uh, so but we had a few successes, but it wasn't. Um, I don't think we ever returned any. Well, I know we didn't return anything to the investors because I would have had skimmed off a little bit of that to personal, which never happened. <laughs> it was not a lucrative thing, and, and I decided after a while I was going to you know go back to operational work, and and uh, so. But it, I learned a lot as a about investing now. So, so Tom, you, on your uh, travels, excuse me, just one more yeah, question. Yeah, yeah. On your uh, rotation through the hill, as you put it, um, are any of those people still left? And who do you think are the biggest advocates for public health that we could rely on now in, in Congress? Well, that's a, that's a really good question. I mean, I think... Um, uh, obviously, the, the, the Carter administration, I mean, I think the world has, and Congress has now, you know, everyone's aware of what happened with respect to a, a health impact on the economy and, and our whole way of life. So it should, it's been transformational. And Tony become a, you know, public figure as a result. And so I, but specifically, um, I, you know, I, I think, honestly, I'm not sure I, I know how to answer that question, who, who I would, but I, you know, I, I, I count on my, I think everybody's counting on their representatives to, uh, I mean, we had a broken public health system. Um, and, you know, it's, it's gradually, I think that this has all forced it to grow up a bit. Um, but it's, uh, I mean, the other question is, you know, we have now we have great organizations like CEPI doing, supporting, you know, putting, getting money together from various national sources, others. Of course, Gates has done their thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, we had Operation Warp Speed and, and shown, you know, how we could do this. But the question, what's next? You know, what's called disease X and how to prepare for it. Um, I mean, when I, I look at what's being done, I uh, made, made progress, but I think it's still kind of befuddled. I mean, you can't expect Barda and Seppi, you know, I mean, if you try to make a vaccine or an antiviral drug against all of the potential, you know, you bankrupt the country very quickly. Uh, so we need uh, platforms. I'm not sure mRNA is really the answer yet, uh, but things like that, and we have to have broad-spectrum antivirals, and so I, I see that, you know, the leadership's going to come from NIH, and then uh, mm. when things get a little bit more fully baked, they'll go to BARDA and these other organizations, so we kind of have that system in place, but um, I think flu's going to kill us all, actually, I mean, I don't know, I guess, I guess we'll... <laughs> uh, and so, you know, when you look at influenza, uh, so still making influenza vaccines. That's so right. Yeah. So right? Are you upset with the fact that people can refuse to do the right thing when there is a solution 
and it was, it's working, and the proof is overwhelming, and there are still people that say, I don't care. Uh, you know, are you allowed not to care with regards to the public's health? How enforceable is public health versus individual freedom? That's that's really my question. Well, okay. It used to be quite, it was certainly there. I mean, we had <clears throat> laws on quarantine and other things, but right. now it's getting much harder, I think. And um, how, how did we allow that to happen, Tom? <laughs> you and me. <laughs> <laughs> You know, that's why uh, I'm not I'm not a political sort of animal, well, really. I, I, I do know that. Like, I'm, I'm not going to, yeah, I'm not going to give you a solution because I don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> but you think the solution is political? In a large sense, yes, I think so. Right. Um, right. Well, financial, political. Mm. We, we more, used to but, have so much trust in science and and in the results of science and the application of science, people have forgotten how much of their lives are driven by science. If you took that away, <clears throat> they'd feel like they were put in prison. No car, no TV, no cell phone, no nothing, right? It's like <clears throat> like living on an island out in the middle of the Pacific. So where did they lose the sense that everything they owe to their lives as people, including the refrigeration that you have for your food so it doesn't spoil and the preservatives, et cetera, that all disappeared someplace. And, and there are people out there that say, oh, that doesn't work. That's bullshit. And excuse the expression, but that's that's what they really say. And, and people are willing to believe them. And I think that's just driving us crazy. You know, it, it takes away the incentive from people who are smart enough to participate in public health, but they see the criticism that's going on now, and we're not recruiting at the same level as we used to. I think that's that's my observation, at least, which is a shame, an absolute shame. Yeah. Uh, in a way, SARS-CoV-2 wasn't deadly enough. Okay. Uh, uh, well, <laughs> all you would need is some smallpox to sweep through the country, and the attitudes, mm -hmm. uh, the attitudes would change. And when it comes to yeah, the politics, I always think of there's two related quotes that we've talked about before on Twiv. One, Tom, is from Bob Chen, who says that. Uh, public health is, by its very nature, a mashup of science and politics, okay? And the other is Peter Daszak, who says, when you mix science and politics, you get politics. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly right. That's right. Well, it's, uh, you know, like uh, fat floats and something else floats. <laughs> Tom, uh, I wonder if I could ask you, there's a part of your CV I find really interesting also, and that is this company, New Link Genetics, and, of course, they making the first uh, Ebola virus vaccine. You can give us a little of that story, if you could. Sure. Yeah, well, I... Um, in 2014, I uh, I got a call from a guy who was I, I sort of knew a little bit who was working for them, trying to recruit somebody who could lead this effort. Because what happened was they um, there had been a lot of work on Ebola vaccines, right, uh, over the years, and funded by DOD and NIH. Um, and then Ebola really came along um, in a big way, of course, in the West African outbreak. So New Link had acquired a license to a candidate who had been developed in Canada, the Public Health Agency of Canada. It was a uh, viral vector vaccine using vesicular stomatitis as the vector. And uh, so a very similar concept to, you know, the Chimera vax and so on. And... Um, so I saw this as an amazing opportunity. Um, and New Link was an oncology company. They had no infectious disease programs. Uh, they had this asset, but didn't know what to do with it. And um, so I came on board and, and um, I brought a whole bunch of my ex canvas colleagues and so on and on. It, at, this, at that time, it was um, the, the first lots were being manufactured under contract in Germany. And um, 
so there's been enough preclinical work done to really move it quickly into the clinic. So that happened within two months of my joining. We got it. And, but I, uh, around that time, I can't ex- do the exact timelines with before or after I joined, but Merck uh, expressed an interest in, in, in licensing this. And um, so they did a deal very quickly with New Link, and, uh, but they wanted a, our team to stay on and work with them. Um, so that's what functionally happened. And, you know, in retrospect, it was kind of like the BioNTech Pfizer thing on uh, COVID. So, uh, but for a while, Merck was, they're very generous. I mean, absolutely wonderful to work with. Uh, great scientists and just very nice. And we, you know, we had project meetings twice a week and we were working closely with Merck and um, but unlike BioNTech and Pfizer, they, they kept the New Lake name alive for a while, but then it, it sort of disappeared. And, but we did, you know, we brought the vaccine through um, full clinical development, ultimately to licensure. And fortunately, the WA, I mean, the controversy at the time was the CDC and NIH and WHO were all vying for uh, getting pivotal phase three trials done. And they divided up the world. So CDC took uh, Sierra Leone, NIH took Liberia, and WHO decided on Guinea. If you look at the epidemic curves at the time, you would have said that Sierra Leone would be the best bet because there was still quite a lot of disease going on. Liberia was rapidly being brought under control just by infection control measures. And Guinea sort of piddled along. There was a kind of a longer but much lower uh, incidence of disease there. And But WHO, that's where they worked and so all three organizations, no one was sure which vaccine was the best. Um, ours looked pretty good. Um, the uh, J&J, under the leadership of Paul Stoffel, who was a tropical medicine guy who worked at the Congo and was the top tier of J&J making decisions, they um, uh, you know, had an adenovirus vector vaccine, and so um, ultimately WHO, uh, all, all three decided to test our vaccine, <clears throat> but WHO decided to use only that vaccine in their study and and did a, a clinical trial. Uh, different, they were all different designs because it, ethically it was questionable mm-hmm. whether you could do a randomized placebo-controlled study that what looked like effective vaccines and a lethal disease. So um, there are ways of randomizing that don't involve placebos, and that's what all three countries did. Uh, and in Guinea, it was kind of a ring vaccination trial like uh, the smallpox studies were. And anyway, it was extremely effective and um, very safe and so that was a winner, 100% efficacy mm. in the WHO study. And nobody who'd been vaccinated, I think it was six, six days, within six days of vaccination, nobody got sick. Mm. Um, so pretty extraordinary. And, but we've been, uh, you know, it's kind of like the J.E. Dengue's Chimerovac story because we're working with uh, uh, BSV vectors uh, with BARDA on Marburg and uh, NIPA virus with uh, a CEPI funded program right now. So I'm doing. And, you know, the, for whatever, you, you switch the uh, vectors and things get more difficult. So, 
Um, these platform tech, I guess the lesson there is these platform technologies seem great, but um, you can't rely on it to work in the same way every mm. time. Yeah. Yeah, I I appreciate what you said about mRNA platform. You know, we yeah, are I, we're wowed yeah. by it, but yeah. yeah, you take a critical view. Maybe it's not going to work for everything, right? Right. Mm -hmm. So currently, you're at Crozet Biopharma, so you're yeah. overseeing additional vaccine development, right? Yeah. Well, when um, the, one of the things New Link did was help Merck get government money, principally barter, because Merck didn't want to do government contracting. And so New Link did that yeah. for them. We're basically uh, biotech money launderers. And uh, <laughs> so, but then Merck decided that, in fact, they would um, it, uh, do that. And the Ebola thing wound down. So we uh, went our own way, stuck, the group had stuck together and I formed a company called Crozet. You might wonder, everybody asks, where's the name come from? <laughs> and uh, so our chief medical officer, Gray Hepner, is an old army colleague and he lives in Crozet, Virginia. So uh, I was talking to him and I thought, what are we going to call this company? So he said, let's call it Crozet Biofarm. <laughs> so that's what, <laughs> where the name came from. But, um, and you know, always people asked, uh, I get a call when a canvas got named. Somebody called me and he said, what do you, somebody answered the phone there and said, you're on a campus. What campus are you on? <laughs> <laughs> so the name came from the, the British company that had merged with a peptide therapeutics. We were in Cambridge, England, uh -huh. and we were in Cambridge, Mass. So... It was named A, A Cambus was a contract. I kept saying A in Latin is none. It's not both something. So, mm. you know, it wouldn't make sense. But um, that's where A Cambus came from. But mm. eventually, if, if you're successful, even if it's a silly name, it's going to stick. So. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> All the viruses are named after places that they come from. Why shouldn't you name the vaccines after places that they come from also <laughs> <laughs> I think that's you're so right. If the the name sticks, if you hear it enough, right? That's true. So yeah, we've yeah. all heard Moderna forever. It sounds fine now, right? Right. Yeah. Holy cow! And so I noticed with uh, Crozet, you you using CEPI support to do, do some development. Yeah. Yeah. On uh, NIPA, well, we're working with we have a partner called Public Health Vaccines. We kind of co-own. With Crozet, and um, we supply the Crozet's supplying kind of the clinical development expertise. And so, yeah, we're working on uh, a CEPI program with the uh, NIPA virus. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> now we're, you know, it's one of those genera that where there's a lot out there and new virus from China, Langia virus, probably heard of, just popped up, mm -hmm. which is another Hennepa virus. So I think um, every, I mean, it, it's really interesting the role bats play in with all of these horrible diseases. How about that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and um, at the core of it is going to be you're really understanding why, what, how do bats manage to, uh, and they obviously live together in close quarters and but um, the, the immunology of uh, infection in bats is, you know, this is, this is a very interesting. Yeah. Bats come up a lot on TWIV. Yeah. 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 So, Tom, I have, I have one more question. I'm going to let every, uh, everyone else have one more crack. Um, how do you know when you need a vaccine? So, NIPA, you know, there are not a lot of cases, even Bangladesh, right. India. And there's a virus in the U.S., Entero 68, that causes paralysis in kids. Since yeah. since 2014, there have been less than 1,000 cases. So how do you know when you should make a vaccine? Right. Well, EV71 is a you know, related virus that does cause a lot yeah. of disease. But, yeah. um, I, 
It's a really great question. And, and what it, I think what it boils down to is that the organizations that want to address the problem or fund it mm. have to make a plan, a decision. So, you know, and um, so a lot, a lot of it is driven by their exercise of sort of thinking ahead. Um, but how do you, I mean, frankly, I think you think you need a vaccine when something happens, like uh, emergence and an epidemic and an unusual high incidence of disease and scary aspects, either its severity or mode of transmission or something that um, you know, could potentially interhuman transmission could be enhanced. We've mm -hmm. seen that with, with viruses to get passage in the human population that happens. So, but, you know, we've we, we learned that um, these conflagrations um, result in a, a huge effort and often the disease is gone before you have a product. And um, so industry, which plays such an important part here, and um, we sort of pulled the rug out. Of, this has not happened with SARS-CoV-2, of course, but um, uh, avian flu disappeared, SARS-1 disappeared, West Nile disappeared. Um, and you really have to, so you kind of know when you need a product, <laughs> you can't be sure that it's going to remain a, a major public health or growing problem until, you know, it kind of plays out. It's a very difficult mm. feel. I, I, that's why I think that platforms are really the way to, you know, we need plug and play technologies and certainly with antivirals it just seems like you know we, we're not in the position we are with bacterial infections with viruses and I think that's I think that's where a lot of future effort needs to go is to um, you know mm. all right plug and play plug and play that's the yeah. key plug and play <laughs> yes all right yeah all right. Uh, anybody else? Rich, you got anything else? Uh, I'm just um, taken by the your path. There's a a remarkable diversity of experiences, uh, and I we were having a career talk at ASV with Harry Greenberg, and he described himself as a cork in a stream. Okay, <laughs> uh, but I, I, I get the I get the sense that. You're not quite a cork in a stream, despite the diversity of experiences. I'm, I'm sensing, I'm sensing a, <laughs> an underlying sort of theme or motivation. I'm wondering if you could, if you could comment on that, and and uh, you know what, what moves you forward? What has what has motivated all of this? And and also, the flip side, would you have done anything differently if you could do it again? Well, well, I think. I mean, a common theme is I've been, I think this whole concept of emerging infections and the underlying fascinating world of the biology of viruses and and and, and um, being able, I, I think everything to look at everything I've done has been kind of the same theme. It may look it may look disparate, but. Um, it's, you know, been very concerned about kind of putting together uh, the natural world with viruses and, then, and also, you know, to have practical, tangible means of dealing with things, not just studying them. So, um, I don't know what the hell I would have done with the percular apparatus of salamanders. But, <laughs> you know, <laughs> but uh, I don't know if I've answered your no, that, question. That yeah, gives I, me an idea. Thank you. You were exposed to a lot of people in, early on in your career, though. It had a deep influence on you, I bet. Like, for instance, E.O. Wilson and Carol Williams and uh, Thomas mm -hmm. Weller. All of those people were naturalists underneath all of that uh, subterfuge yeah. of, you know, <clears throat> playing the game so they could get promoted. And, 
Um, I think you had a brilliant beginning, and to stick with diversity of life at all levels is the name of the game. I think that's what everybody is deeply interested in, and I think disease plays a role in population control and where people can live and where their animals can live and that sort of thing. So uh, I think... (laughs) I wouldn't call you lucky because you got to choose your future, and um, there are very few of us that have had that privilege, and I think you've made a wonderful uh, example for anybody who follows in your footsteps. Well, Deeply thank respect you, you Tom. Opportunistic in, in a sense. We didn't touch on the One Health thing, but I've been very involved with that. We started the One Health initiative, and I mean, this fits... It fits so well into, uh, you know, my my interest. And it's amazing how it's kind of taken off with the concept. Nobody's really, I don't know, how practical. I, I thought you were involved in that, but I didn't see it on your CV. So yeah, that's, that's uh, basically a sort of a holistic view of um, uh, public health that uh, brings in uh, veterinary science and agricultural yeah. science and and uh, humans, et cetera, to, to sort of address this idea of emergence and spread of disease. Am I talking right. straight? Yeah. No, that's right. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that makes just all kinds of sense. And you were in on the, the ground floor of that, right? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. So, is it, so um, go ahead. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I, so, Kind of backing up a little bit to the the politics and public health discussion, um, and I know you're not a politician, but you've had extensive experience on the government side and on the private industry side, um, and now the experience with the pandemic. Um, And one of the concerns that I hear certainly from people in public health is, yeah, it's great, you know, people are paying attention to public health now, but this is the history of public health going back for centuries is... There's this huge spike in interest, and then you know whatever the current crisis is gets resolved, and oh gee, we really could spend that money better on something else. And so there's the cratering that comes afterward. Um, uh, one of the things you just mentioned um, in response to Vincent's question, actually, the the idea of these these platforms that okay, we're developing a vaccine for this, but we can also flip it over and you know pivot and develop a vaccine for something else when it becomes an issue. Are there other strategies like that that you see in either industry or um, or in um, the government side of public health where people could kind of anticipate the funding roller coaster and say, well, regardless of where it is, we can work on this and then it'll be available when we need it. Are there, are there other kind of little tricks that <laughs> people should be thinking about that way? I, well, first of all, I, I agree with the principle. I mean, um, it's kind of, you know, a lot of science has dual purposes. I mean, you can, and um, uh, so, for example, you know, I, again, I was mentioned very involved in the biodefense sort of field. We always had a problem. How do you incent uh, work on uh, a threat agent uh, that has no practical public health significance and so on unless it's used in them. And the obvious answer is well, let's look at the other applications of the technology. And so I think, I mean, without being specific about something like I mean, DNA, mRNA, um, viral vectors, um, there are uh, you know, they may be applied to some specific problem, but they have uh, potential broader application. I think you just have to look look for those uh, kind of opportunities and, and pursue them. But I think that's, uh, I don't know, again, I'm not sure if I answered your question. But no, I, that's, think, uh, yeah. I wasn't expecting a definitive, oh, we need to do X, Y, and Z, but yeah. uh, just, just speculation along those yeah. lines. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right. We've, so we've, I only have one more question. Go ahead, Dixon. For Tom, and that is, when was the last time you ate at Bertha's Muscles? <laughs> Do you remember the dinner that we had there? 
Yeah. That's where we met, and uh, I've never forgotten that dinner. It was it absolutely was riveting. Yeah, it was, it was sweet. Yeah. Where's Birth of the Muscles? It's in Baltimore. Yeah. All and right. It's a wonderful place to get muscles. And uh, yes. We um, and we, bumper stickers and bumper stickers. This is true, but we had an an, an eclectic <laughs> group that actually met there. It was six of us all together, as I recall. And um, I walked away just saying, "Where the hell have I been all my life?" And I have just barely started my career. And I, mean, <laughs> I learned so much by just shutting my mouth and eating those wonderful muscles and listening to you guys banter back and forth. It was wonderful, quite memorable. I'd like to do that again sometime, actually. Oh, me too. I don't think I've had muscles since. Yeah, that's right. Tom Monath, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Great conversation. Absolutely. Thank you very Thanks much. A lot, Tom. Thank, you. thank you, Tom. You know, something, awesome. something I was thinking of, do you, do you actually always know when someone has influenced you greatly? You know, we talked about Absolutely. people. Do you always know or are there some influences that you're not aware of? I'm sure think, there are some you're not aware of. There, you interact with people, and then you do something differently, and and it. I, I sometimes I catch myself doing something. And I think, gosh, you know that that guy I talked to, hmm. probably right. was like, yeah. made me think to yeah. do this, and that's it's not right. anything that's like right. major yeah, life decisions. I'm still but, figuring out what happened. You know. Yeah. <laughs> sure. <laughs> and, and, and yeah. Tom, Tom is just. Uh, I've been wanting to have a conversation with him for a long time because it's like it's like he's not one of these marquee types, okay? Mm, Who's yeah. you know in big lights everywhere, but everywhere I go, uh, he him. seems to, he, he seems to be in the foundation <laughs> no, somewhere. Oh, absolutely, and, That's and, right. and everybody and, knows Tom and, Moore. And there it is. You heard it. Okay, he's yeah, he's yeah, he's yeah. He's, yeah. he's been there all the time doing all this amazing That's stuff. Right. That's yeah, right. when you when you emailed and said we're going to have Tom Monath on the show, I was like, oh, Tom Monath. Wait, yeah, where exactly do I? I, yeah. I, I know the yeah. name. Where and and then I looked at the at the show notes. I said, oh, I know the name from everywhere. Is where I. That's why I can't yeah. quite place and, it. And for me, it really it really popped to the surface when I read Fever. Okay, because yeah. I was uh, familiar with the name. Sure, I sure. knew he and was out that there. Guy again. And then yeah, yeah, all yeah. of a sudden, wait a minute. Okay. Yeah. He right. identified right. the vertebrate host for loss of fever. Yep. No, that's great. I, I, uh, yep. I mean, he, he just... If Tom Monath did not exist, it would be necessary to invent him. <laughs> <laughs> you'd, you'd need a dozen people. <laughs> that's true. No, I mean, he, true. Uh, a lot of the things we've been talking about, he touched on, you know, antibodies, yeah. T cells, yeah. correlates. Yeah. He gets it. No, he's, he's thinking about it all the time. It's good. He gets it, is right. Actually, the, uh, uh, the sort of new eye opener for me was the difference between the Camarivax vector Japanese encephalitis vaccine and the dengue vaccines. Oh, uh, certainly the right. different serotypes, the fact that uh, dengue has multiple serotypes play into it. Right. But yeah. right. Uh, it, it sounds to me as if there are fundamentally different correlates of protection as well, which is what yeah. we've been talking about all the time. Here, it's here. really a, a, a huge yeah. problem. One size does not fit all. Yeah, exactly. So, so uh, he, Tom is a... Uh, a treasure, essentially. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's you right. Know? That's right. Yeah, that's right. It's a treasure. You got him. You're lucky. You got him, Vincent. You're right. You're really lucky. Well, you got uh, him. not that Rich, you wouldn't come on. Rich, just, uh, Rich got him, but I'm sure he would come on. You know, because oh, yeah. Yeah. he likes oh, yeah, talking. But he does. He does. So, well, and we're twiv. This is you know, <laughs> we most people are twiv. Are here. That's right. <laughs> uh, let's do let's do some picks. But I just want to shout out to Elka. Wolans in Belgium, okay? Elke Wolans, hello. Uh, I was at European Clinical Virology Society meeting in Manchester a couple of weeks ago. I was leaving the banquet because I had to get up at 3.30 or 3 o'clock to get a flight. She comes running after me and she said, I want a, <laughs> self I want a selfie. Uh, I said, okay. She said, I listen to every episode. I said, great, I'll, I'll thank you on the next one. She said, no, you won't, you'll forget. So I took a picture. Uh, I took a picture of her ID card, and you wrote down in your little notebook, that's Elka. Right, that's right. Elka well, Wallace, hello, people. and uh, I hope you're listening because you just listened to a really good episode. 
Yes. Right. right. I, when I see people running after me at the airport, I think, oh my God, I left my passport in the money's room. <laughs> and that actually it did happen to me once. My bags so are being there. taken away to be destroyed. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What did I do wrong? <laughs> exactly, exactly, exactly. All right. Picks of the week, Dixon. What do you have for us? Well, we're into the small group jazz uh, ensemble, and this is small group number three. Uh, we've already done the Miles Davis uh, uh, quintet, and uh, we did the modern jazz quartet last week, or last time we had a twip, a twiv rather. And this is uh, group number three, the Dave Brubeck quartet. And I'm mm. sure everybody's familiar with him. Yeah, it's uh, great. There's Dave Brubeck piano, Joe Morello drums, Paul Desmond alto sax, and Eugene Wright bass. Signature album, Time Out, in which most of the music was written not by Dave Brubeck, but by Joe Morello, because Joe Morello wanted syncopation, and he wanted huh? diversity, and everything is in 4-4 four, four time or 3-4 time, and nothing is in either one of those um, signatures for this album, and that's why the signature mm-hmm. song is Take 5. And uh, everybody knows that song, too, and I'm sure they do. I saw them live many times. I, I don't remember how many times. Uh, it was like maybe 20 times over my lifetime. And I was never, ever disappointed. They performed brilliantly. The solos, of course, were different than the record. So my first jazz record ever was a Dave Brubeck record. Mm. And that just started me on my journey. And I'm, I'm still, still trucking. Yeah, I hear five out of four listeners love this song. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I always... Uh, I, it's, it's in 5-4 yeah. time. Is well, the, it is. The, it truly um, is. Uh, that album, yeah. I've always regarded as sort of uh, a laboratory. It was an experiment in, exactly uh, in, t- right. in time exactly. signatures, okay? That's right. It's got Do you have a favorite from that album? a whole assortment of wild time signatures. Yeah. yeah. Do you have a, a, a favorite song from that album? I haven't listened to it in so long. Because uh, my favorite Dixon, is Do Rondo to... a la Turk. Uh-huh. I and would have to listen is... to it again. Oh, you would know it right away. You hear oh, it sure. in grocery stores now. Yeah. Because it's part of Muzak, unfortunately. Really? They're just, uh, yeah, they've taken a lot of these songs and put them out for the general public. Nobody knows what they're listening to. They just shop, that's all. But um, <clears throat> this, I, this is worth listening to again. And again, Interesting. and again. So it was recorded in 19, it was released in 1959. It was recorded at exactly. Columbia's 30th Street Studio in New York City. Look at that. Look Guess at where that. I am right now. Um, I'm on, let me think. not that exact studio, but you're. <laughs> I'm on 30th. I'm between 29th yeah. and 30th. Um, right. I don't know where, where this was. The Columbia Street Studio. Let's look it up. Actually, maybe you are in the same. Do you think okay. it's still in existence? Actually, it was in this same room that I'm in. Right? <laughs> Just kidding. Okay, here we go. The CBS 30th Street Studio. I have a feeling it's more east. Third Avenue. Yeah, it's on the east side. Third, Third Avenue. Avenue. Okay. Right. Nicknamed The Church. <laughs> the Church. Well, there's not many uh, recording studios left here in uh, New York City. You're right. You are right. And actually, when we were looking for space... The realtor said, you know, you can get a lot of old studio space, really big studio space. I don't think I really need really big studio space, but we could have looked at it because they've all closed. You know, Very interesting. Rich, what do you have for us? So my pick is a company <laughs> in uh, Africa, an ecotourism company called Wilderness Safaris. And I've got both their uh, website here and a Wikipedia entry on the company. So... Uh, one of the reasons that I've been uh, absent for a while is that my uh, wife and I, along with the Boston family of four, uh, cool. my, my daughter and her husband and their two kids, ages 14 and 11, went together on a uh, trip to Africa. How uh, wonderful. That involved uh, a couple of days in Cape Town, a couple of days in a... Um, uh, uh, private reserve bordering uh, Kruger National Park a day in Victoria Falls and then another couple of days in a camp on the Okavango River Delta in Botswana and then uh, stop off in Johannesburg on the way home. Uh, this was all uh, uh, organized by a, a travel agent here in the U.S., but she basically subcontracted a very large percentage of it 
to this uh, African company called uh, Wilderness Safaris that I learned a lot about there. They started off as about 30 years ago of two guys who were, uh, you know, essentially conservationists, okay, and interested in wildlife, uh, but also interested in making a living. And so they kind of invented ecotourism. Um, and uh, the idea is to uh, 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 help people like me um, appreciate uh, the wildlife uh, in, in Africa uh, and funnel a significant fraction of the proceeds into conservation efforts of one sort or another, and which they have done oh, nice. quite religiously and quite successfully, including reintroducing species uh, into areas, uh, uh, making available more um, protected land, uh, educational programs. That they, they operate a number of different safari camps uh, around South Africa and Botswana uh, and elsewhere. Uh, yeah, several other uh, comp uh, companies in sub-Saharan, uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, at some point during a year, uh, uh, a, a number of them uh, shut down and are used entirely for field trips for uh, kids, okay? Oh, that are wow. uh, that's sponsored by Wilderness Safaris. And, uh, so one of, and, and they did everything. I mean, we had a tour guide in Cape Town. There were meet and greet people er everywhere. We had, uh, you know, we stayed at uh, Wilderness Safari's uh, collaborative uh, lodges. Uh, they, they had uh, trackers and et cetera. They even have their own now small airline, okay? I, I saw wow. they have their own air charter yeah. company so, that does their flights. So uh, uh -huh. you, don't, you don't get to the camps in the uh, uh, Okavango River Delta on anything other than like a 12-seater Cessna. Okay, right. uh, and so they fly into these dirt strips out in the middle of nowhere, and nobody's going to do that. Mm. They had to invent their own airline in order to do it. I, we had this wonderful young African woman pilot who flew us into uh, Botswana. <laughs> it was just, just a hoot. So at any rate, a big shout out to these people because uh, I think they're they're Robin Hoods of the best kind. Okay. Here, here. <laughs> taking Mitch, taking, my, taking my money, and I'm happy to give it to them, and, <laughs> and, and not only supporting themselves, but putting it to good causes. Are nice. you still on anti malarials? No, that uh, goes on for uh, a week after you leave. I've been back for two weeks. Is it a week right. after you leave? Yeah. 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 So yeah, two days I, before and a week after. This looks great. I'm just worried. I don't want to go and trash the environment as a tourist, right? So they're sensitive uh, to that? Oh, 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 I'm glad you brought that up. I wish I had it here. Uh, so um, uh, when you go out <laughs> on safari, okay, which is basically driving around in a Toyota Land Cruiser, exactly. fit out especially to take you around, um, everybody has to have water. They give you a right. water bottle that they refill for you every day. No plastic. There's no plastic anywhere. Okay. In right. in my room in our rooms, well, this one of the things that's noticeable is you got a little trash bag, right? Uh, a, a, a waste basket. And any other place that'd be lined with a plastic liner, there's paper bags inside. Right. Okay. Right. So they're extraordinarily uh, mm -hmm. environment conscious. Okay, Good. and uh, and as you go out and around these places, uh, there's there's no trash, there's no litter at all. And uh, if uh, on the very rare occasion where you find some, the rangers zero right on that and pick it up. So we were really impressed with they uh, they walk the walk. Okay. Excellent. Yep. Alan, have you been to Africa at all? I have not. It's, um, you know, definitely an experience I'd love to have. I've actually looked into, um, uh, I hadn't seen these folks, but now they're definitely on my radar. Um, I had looked into self-fly safaris mm -hmm. where they take a group of pilots. Oh, um, interesting. And you, <laughs> interesting. You go and you, you, the first thing you do is spend a week in uh, either Cape Town or Johannesburg um, getting your U.S. pilot's license converted to a South African pilot's license <laughs> so you can fly CA registered planes. Um, and then they, they take the group around, you know, and guide them into these sort of dirt strips, but in uh, even smaller airplanes. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I don't know if that'll actually happen. But something like this is something I can probably convince my wife to be into. Well, I need to. Um, 
stay healthy and stay alive because I would like to go back. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, it's just absolutely unique. It's wonderful. We saw everything. And, and it, well, we didn't see gorillas. That's why I'm going back. I want to see the gorillas. <laughs> Did you see any pangolins? Uh, no, didn't see any pangolins. Okay. Okay. Um, so you have two things to go back yeah, for. Yeah, I have two things to go back for. But uh, giraffes are still my favorite. We asked one of our yeah, trackers. Yeah, I agree with you. We, we asked agree. one of our trackers, what's your favorite animal? He says, any baby one. Uh, <laughs> I love that. That's good. That's good. Nice. A giraffe, there's no other animal like it. Oh, no. Giraffes are just so cool. And you can't see them. You know, right. they're going to be a <laughs> right. big, big old exactly. giraffe right in front exactly. of your eyes. And exactly you can't right. see it. The, the, why? Uh, why can't you see it? Because they're, you know, they're they blend they're in with the tree or so well. I see. Okay. And all the trees are trimmed to the height yeah. of the giraffes. Yes, I want. Right. I want to see. Uh, I want to see lemurs, but I have to go to Madagascar. For yeah, that. you're gonna have to go to Ooh, Madagascar that's a tough one. for that. That's a and they're tough small, one. right? You're flicking around in the trees. Some are pretty big. Some yeah. are pretty big. Have you been to Madagascar, Dixon? No, but I, I knew a woman who was a lemur expert who threatened to invite me back hmm. to where she was from, which was uh, director of a lemur biology program in Madagascar, and then the plague broke out. So I don't know what happened to her. I'm, I haven't heard back from her See, at all. But lemurs biologically are very interesting because they have endogenous SIV, <laughs> and nobody else does. Hmm. It's very cool. Did and not know that. They live on this island right which is pretty far away from <laughs> so how did they get how did they get there? siv yeah, yeah it's a very good question the thing that uh, lemurs are <clears throat> amazing animals because they jump from tree to tree right but there are many thorny bushes in madagascar that doesn't stop them hmm. and i don't know how they avoid those spines but they do one of david Quammen's books he talks about there's a whole chapter on Lee. He goes somewhere and watches them flicking through the trees. Yeah, that's ah. just amazing. Really good. Yeah. I, I Alan, agree. what do you have for us? I have a book that I read a little while ago um, that uh, we're, I, we're, we're getting into the right season for, for people to read this. This is a book that you, you curl up in a nice warm house and mm -hmm. read. Uh, it's called Madhouse at the End of the Earth by uh, Julian Sancton. And this is the story of the um, 1897 Belgian Antarctic Expedition, which, you know, most people have not heard of. Um, the, um, they uh, took a ship called the Belgica and sailed down to Antarctica. And at that time, Antarctica was this, I mean, it was like visiting the moon. It was, this was a huge expedition and for Belgium to mount an expedition like this was a really really big deal um, and um, they uh, you know they proceeded down there um, and uh, the captain kind of accidentally on purpose got them frozen into the ice <laughs> for the winter um, that was not the original plan, at least not as outlined, but he was facing a number of difficulties on the voyage that the book discusses, <laughs> and um, they ended up um, uh, freezing into the ice. Um, and they were the first ship to, uh, to overwinter in the Antarctic, in the Antarctic mm. that far south. And so after this had happened, after the ice locked the ship in, um, shortly thereafter, they watched the sun go down, and it did not come back up, right. of course, for months. Mm. And they were there on their ship, just these uh, about 20 guys um, frozen into the ice, which they could hear creaking yeah. against the side of the ship, and they didn't know whether or not or when it would crush yeah. the ship. Mm sending it to the bottom and leaving them stranded on the ice with no Shackleton's equipment. Shackleton's boat to say like that. Um, yes, this was mm. a, a real risk, and they went crazy because they were sitting there in the dark, wow. and That's right. everybody was having, you know, the, the nobody knew about um, the importance of light to circadian biology. Uh, there was a doctor on board who later became famous for some not so good things, um, but he uh, probably saved lives on the crew by by hypothesizing that light was important, and he the the ones who were most 
uh, who had gone most nutty, he would have them sit around a bright fire to you know expose them to light mm. because he had he had figured out that there was something to do with the fact that they were in the dark that was a big part of the problem. Um, mm. And there's uh, there's also a, a Norwegian fellow named Roald Amundsen um, <laughs> on board who was a young young fellow at the time oh who signed goodness. on to this expedition oh and who then went on to do. Um, significant exploration at both poles hmm. uh, but it's just it's a it's an cool. amazing psychological profile of what this experience was for these people <clears throat> isolated at the end of the earth and Sancton has done a really astonishing job of journalism on it he went to original sources he got um, uh, got access to the original logs and notes from the family of the the descendants of the captain um of this expedition hmm. uh, and really he's an excellent writer as well and you just he puts you there and that's why i say it's a good book to yeah. to curl up with in a warm house it would be also be a good summer beach read i think but <laughs> I, I think for the, for the real mood you ought to have snow falling right. uh, it looks like there are Alan. photographs is that right yes there are photographs uh cook the the doctor um was a uh, an avid photographer, which at that time was a rather yeah. cumbersome process. And in fact, he was um, one of the things the book mentions is he was processing his uh, his plates um, next to the captain's cabin, and that may actually have had uh, kind of an impact on the captain's later health because <laughs> there's cyanide that's used in processing these old uh, plates. Great, uh, but there are, there are photos uh, in it um, of the the crew tolerating all this experience. Did they ever get Did off you? the boat? That, well, that's they, a spoiler alert. Uh, that's they, a spoiler. they walked around. No, 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 they walked around on the ice. They hunted. Um, and um, they, uh, so the other thing was they all started to suffer from scurvy. Mm, yeah. Because, uh, and at that time, it was it was actually not until like the 1950s that we knew what caused scurvy. Huh. So there was this tremendous fear among sailors. Oh, oh my gosh, you know, scurvy, it just stalks us and, you know, sometimes randomly people fall apart because of it um but you know again cook figured out that the fresh provisions were going to be the key to this so he had the he had the men hunting seals uh, especially and penguins um and eating as much of their meat as raw as possible um which delicious. was dis yes absolutely disgusting apparently better than what the cook was pouring out Tastes of the bad just cans like krill. um but yes <laughs> So uh, <laughs> I, I guess you're not going to tell us what happens at the end. Does the water thaw they, and they move off? Most of them, yeah. So they get they get out. They manage to save the ship, and most of the uh, most of the individuals on board survive the journey. Okay. They, did they sail the ship? Were they able to sail the ship back? They sailed the ship. Uh, they sailed the ship all the way back to Belgium. Wow! That's amazing. Yeah. So they're of That's correct amazing. mind to be able to sail. <laughs> <laughs> they yeah they well just barely and and just barely sound enough from the scurvy to huh. uh, wow. to be able to get wow. the ship out of the ice and what sail a great home. story very cool yeah it's, it's an awesome story All right nice uh, my pick is the second installment of of detective fiction some of my favorite detective fiction and this is Raymond Chandler the author is Raymond Chandler. And his protagonist uh, is Philip Marlowe, of course. And last time the protagonist was Martin Beck. Mm -hmm. Raymond Chandler, uh, an American writer, founder of the uh, hard-boiled school, actually American-British, hard-boiled school of detective fiction. So really tough, <laughs> really tough people. I, I really like uh, Lady in the Lake. It's actually a bit different from the, most of them take place in, in Los Angeles, and this one is outside of the city. For some, I, I read these mostly as a as a postdoc. This was a long time ago, and I, there was something I liked about Lady in the Lake. I also liked The Big Sleep, uh, which and, and many of these were made into movies. Of course, Dixon says Robert Mitchum was in the movie version of Lady in the Lake. Yeah, no, no, in uh, the Big Sleep. It Big Sleep. Big Sleep. Yeah, it was fantastic. Absolutely um, fantastic. Here's a quote from Lady in the Lake. Um, I don't like your manner, Kingsley said, <clears throat> in a voice you could have cracked a Brazil nut on. <laughs> that's all right, I said. I'm not selling it. <laughs> I think that's great. That's hard-boiled. Crack the Brazil yeah. nut on. I'm not sure if I read these today, I would like them as much. Ah. Because when I was thinking about it, there's 
really very little character development. You compare it to Martin Beck where you're getting into his head and all his insecurities and problems, right, are part of the whole story. But these guys are hard-boiled. There's, there's some, there are things wrong with them like everyone, but you're not going to learn much about it because they have a tough exterior. So, but you get that that 1940s repartee like this. Exactly that's right. That's These are probably yeah. what that I like. Noir it. movies, every one of them. How long is yeah. this? Uh, how long is uh, your list of uh, detective fiction going to be? Just five. Okay. Just five. Okay. Just five. Um, so, uh, I I mean, you know, the Sweden the Swedish uh, ones are really good, but uh, there may be another one of those. <clears throat> but uh, that's two so far. Uh, and then we have a listener pick from Philip. He writes, I would like to submit this as a listener pick. It's an article. Um, I guess it's NBC 29. Several students bitten by bats inside resident halls of Ohio College. Bats in dorms at the College of Wooster. It's in Ohio. Nearly a dozen students have come into contact with bats and some have been bitten. Not good. I can imagine that creates a, yep. a bit of a problem. Yeah, it's not good to be bitten by bats. Uh, I assume that they um, have all been given rabies vaccines uh, yeah. because, right, that's a risk factor. Another student said bats have been an ongoing problem at the college. Hmm. Yep. All right. Thank you, Philip. That'll do it for TWIV 939. Show notes at microbe.tv. Slash Twiv. You can send your questions, comments, picks to Twiv at microbe.tv. If you like what we do, please consider supporting us. Microbe.tv slash contribute. Dixon de Pommier, trichinella.org, the living river.org. Thanks, Dixon. Always, always a pleasure, Rich. Always a pleasure. <laughs> really, oh, no, that's my time. line. Oh, no, I'm sorry. That's your line. That's right. <laughs> what is your line, Dixon? Do you have a line? <laughs> I don't have a line. Always a good time. It's always a oh, good no. time. Oh, that's rich. Yeah. No, I just, I had a wonderful time and I enjoyed meeting an old friend and discussing the world with him. He's Man. great. He's absolutely great. Thank you for having him. Yep. Alan Dove's at alandove.com. Alan Dove on Twitter. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. Did I there see a, a cat on his lap at some point there at the end? You did. Yes, a cat climbed up onto his lap and was kind of batting <laughs> at him. It was, it was very cute. It was a black cat, right. right? Yeah. That's cool. Very cool. Rich Condit is an emeritus professor, University of Florida, Gainesville, currently in Austin, Texas. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time, and it's great to be back talking with you guys. Yeah, it's been a few weeks. Yep. Yeah. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology and the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV and Ronald Jenkins for the music. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral.